think perhaps we can start. All right. And I'll go ahead. All right. I think I have suitably arranged pictures of people and the chat and everything. Uh, okay. So hi. Um, I'm Leslie. Um, just, I guess I give you a small bit of background. Um, my PhD thesis, which I have to admit I finished in 1990, which is like ancient history, was about reinforcement learning. And I will tell you why I started to work on reinforcement learning and what conclusion I drew from it. So the story about how I started working on reinforcement learning is that I finished my undergraduate degree actually in philosophy, but never mind that. But I had done a bunch of computer science and I got hired at SRI, which is a research institute, and they were working on, this was before my, like, yeah, after my bachelor's. Anyway, they were working on trying to make a robot do some stuff. And they had had a really strong robot robotics program there and they made Shaky, which was this amazing robot, but basically all the people who had done that left. And then there were just a bunch of us like complete newbies who were supposed to make this robot do things that we didn't know anything, like really nothing. So there was one guy who's an awesome engineer and he made the, ro made the physical robot. And somehow I was a software person and I knew something about AI. And so I was given the job of trying to make the robot do stuff. And so I tried to program the robot to go straight down the hallways in the building. And the robot had these terrible sonar sensors which would, they, they gave you just really bad data. And so I had to write this program. I was supposed to write a program to make the robot go down the hall. So I didn't even know anything about control theory, but I kind of, you know, I managed to reinvent proportional control because that's not too hard to figure out. And, um, but still it was really hard to do. And every time I'd write a program, it would be wrong and the robot would crash into the wall and I would bring the robot back and I would try to fix it. Then I'd make a new program and then the robot would crash into the wall, hopefully now for a different reason. And then I would try to fix the program. And eventually, like after a few weeks, uh, I had a pretty good program. Um, and what I figured out was that I had learned how to make a robot use its sonar sensors to drive down the hallway. And But the lesson that I drew immediately from that experience was that I should not be the person who was learning that. It should be the robot and not me. So then that's a good motivation for doing learning because you would take the human out of that loop. And what I was doing was basically, it was policy search, um, guided by, I'm not sure what, not exactly continuous gradients, but I was doing policy search. Okay, so reinforcement learning. So, uh, so it's a really cool and useful paradigm for all kinds of things. And so I worked on that for a while and I actually even had a robot do actual reinforcement learning during my actual thesis defense, which was kind of exciting. Um, but then I got interested in trying to solve big problems. Like, and I found that I didn't see how to get RL to do exactly the things that I wanted it to do. And so I'm gonna give you a talk today about problems of the kind that I want to solve and the way I think about solving them. Um, and so this is more of like a, this is not a normal kind of class lecture type thing. It's more like a talk I give when I go out in the world and talk about my research, but it connects up very well, I think, with what you folks have been talking about so far in this class. Um, so I'm going to go and talk about this stuff, but I let me say one more time now that everybody's here. I do have my eye on the chat. And I do see the faces of you who have faces, although I do like seeing faces just in case you have one. Um, but do please ask me questions or like, or, or something. Oh, yay, people, cool. Okay, so here we go. All right, so here's what I wanna do. I wanna understand AI. I'm not really trying to make robots to solve any particular problem. I wanna figure out what's the underlying thing, you know, behind intelligent behavior. And here's, an example problem, in fact, I gave this, Philip Isola and Tomas Lozano Perez and I gave, gave, taught a class a few years ago where we were talking about embodied intelligence. And we gave a homework assignment to the students, which was to make tea in the kitchen of somebody else's house without asking questions. Um, and, and that's actually, on the one hand, not obvious, but on the other hand, you can do it. And so I would like to make a robot that could go to anybody's house in the whole world and make whatever flavor of tea-like beverage they like to drink. Uh, and to do that, you'd have to be able to figure out 
that you need to make water hot somehow and you'd have to find the way that these people make their water hot and where they keep the leafy stuff that they like to put in the hot water and so on. So it's an interesting problem, I think, because it's like not all of AI, but it certainly, uh, it helps you think about the variety of things that you would have to do to solve a problem like that. I also want my robot not just to be able to make tea, but to do basically anything you could do. <clears throat> okay, so let's talk about kind of the mathematical framework for thinking about this, at least the way I like to think about it. I like to think about the problem as follows. I like to think that I and you are a robot. We're engineers in a robot factory. So what we have to do, and never mind the hardware for the moment. So let's imagine the hardware is fixed. So the other part of the factory is making the hardware. We're the software people. We have to make software for these robots. And what it means to make software for these robots is to find some policy that's going to go in the robot's head. And this policy is going to have memory, right? So it's going to take the history of, of observations and actions. So raised to the star, that just means as many, as many observation action pairs as you've ever seen and compute the next action. So you can represent any computer program this way, right? There's, I'm not saying anything yet. Right? Just that's we got to put a program in the head of the robot. And this is a way to think about that program. So what program do we want? Well, the way I want to think about what program we should put in the robot's head is the following. We're going to assume that some customer comes and says, here's a distribution over domains that this robot is going to have to work in. So for instance, the distribution over domains might say, oh, it has to work in any house in the whole world. And what it has to do is make tea. Or the distribution of domains could say, you have to work in this one workstation in this one factory and weld this one part of this one car. Or the distribution, the distribution could be anything. It could be, you have to play Atari games. It could be, you have to play all games. It could be whatever, but there's, imagine some distribution over possible problems that this robot is going to have to solve or worlds that it's going to have to operate in. And so what we need to do, we as the engineers need to find a program to put in the robot's head, one program that will work well in expectation over all the possible situations that this robot might find itself in. So um, does this setup make sense? Do you have any questions about this? Like this way of thinking about our job? No, okay. All right, well, so why do I like to think about the problem this way? I like to divide up the problem of making the thing and thinking about what it's supposed to do out in the world. And one of the reasons that I like to think about it this way is that if it were possible to specify the distribution over domains that the robot would have to work in, which I agree is difficult and you know, in general, probably sort of like impossible. But if we were, if we were to be able to specify that, there would be an optimal pie. Like we wouldn't have to argue if it should have learning in it or reinforcement learning or whether it needs symbols or neural network goo or whatever, there would be like from the computational perspective, an optimal policy. So that's good. Like I love, I like to remove grounds for argument because there's lots of arguments going around. But, 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 uh, even if in the land of math, there is an optimal policy for this robot, given the specification, the problem that we have as the robot engineers is that we have to find it. So we have to be able to do this job somehow of taking a specification and making a policy. And I would say that that's what the job that everybody who right now is kind of like working on AI is working on. So how should we do that? So that's the question. Good. If this, if this setup doesn't make sense, I really want you to ask me questions because I'm going to build on it now for an hour. Okay, I trust you. All right. So one way to think about 
this problem that we have, right? So we, we have this distribution over domains. Let's think about some properties of that distribution over domains. So one, let's see, I have my x-axis here. This is informal. This is just kind of to help us talk and think about things. Um, so one axis you could think of as being like, how complicated the job is that the robot has to do, or, or really the way I like to think about it is like, how much variability is there? Right, so over on the left hand side of this axis, this might be like, you know, I don't know, I have to weld this one part in this one factory, or I have to vacuum this one room in this one house, or I have to just do some like really narrow job. And over on the right, I mean to say, oh, this is a very general purpose robot, you could tell it to make you steak dinner and it would figure out how to do that, just very, so that's one axis. And then I think another axis that's important to think about when we're working on this is how much variability, how much uncertainty there is in the factory about the job this robot's gonna have to do, right? So um, you might say, oh, this robot, it's only ever gonna have to do a simple job, but I, when I'm building it, I'm not sure what job it's supposed to do. Okay, so there's, there's a space. And we can think about, we're going to think about some points in this space. So uh, this is basically what I said, right? So how kind of broad is your task and how much do you know about it in advance? All right, so now let's think about ways of, of picking a policy, right? So we said we're going to have to find a policy for uh, problem distribution. We thought about a space of problem distributions. Now let's thinking about a kind of a space of policies. What do we know? And you, you know a bunch of these things. But what I'm interested in is thinking now, just for a minute, really about, in some sense, the engineering methodology about how it is that we can take a, dom a, a domain distribution and come up with a policy. And we would like, we're going to have to spend some human effort to do that, right? Humans are going to have to write down models and maybe make simulators and, I don't know, do teaching and label data and stuff like that. And machines are going to have to do work, right? They're going to have to maybe run optimization algorithms or learning or do parameter tuning or whatever. And I think what we want to do when we think about solving a problem like this is picking model classes, ways of designing these controllers, these policies, where humans have insight, where the optimization easy, is easy, where the learning will work well and so on. This is all kind of vague. So then what I'm gonna do now is drill into these ideas. Okay, so let's think about ways of representing a policy. So this is good, you, you're, you've been studying reinforcement learning. So presumably you know a bunch of these ideas. So my blue box, I'm gonna, this, this blue box is gonna be always a policy which is connected to the world, right? So it takes observations and it generates actions and it can, its job is again to, to take the history of observations and actions and generate a new action. So one way to represent a policy is with a policy. Okay, so that's kind of obvious. You already know how to do that. So it could be that you as engineers just need to make a policy, you put it in there, it's gonna do what it does. That's one way to think about the problem. Um, you may have studied policy search of various kinds. And what we find often with policy search is that for long horizon problems, it's really hard to do policy search. So maybe searching straight up for policies is not so good. Okay, so maybe there's another way. So you could represent a policy. Another way to represent a policy is with Q values, right? If you somehow found a Q function and you put that in there with an argmax, that's a way to, another way to represent a policy. Um, and that can be good. Sometimes it's easier to find the Q values than it is to find the policy directly, right? As an engineering job, and you've studied various kinds of deep Q and whatever. Um, and so Q learning can be useful or, or generally value function learning. Um, but I think value function learning has built into it an idea that you really want to learn offline somehow the value functions over the whole space. Right? It's built on dynamic programming and dynamic programming is built on this principle that says, I'm gonna solve all the subproblems and then I'm gonna take all these little subproblems and I'll use those solutions and put them together to solve uh, other problems and so on, right? So dynamic programming helps you 
when you're going to really be able to make use of all those subproblems that you decided to focus on or that you decided to solve. And so in some problems, this is really a good way to think about it. I would say for things like bicycle riding and juggling and flying a jet, where you have to have a fast response and where the space maybe is not so big. Um, but sometimes uh, it might be more efficient to implement our policy instead of with value functions or with a policy directly to implement our policy by putting some planning in the head of the robot, right? So this is sometimes, um, well, people talk about model-based RL and when they say that they mean usually two different things and one version of model-based RL, they estimate like a transition model and a reward function and they use that to compute the Q and then, and then they're in the situation with the Q really. And what I'm suggesting here is that we could also think about a situation where we estimate the transition function and the reward function. And maybe we use those to estimate a pi and a Q, but online, we actually do some reasoning. Um, and then with that reasoning, maybe we execute the first action in the world, then we see what happens and then we go again. Um, okay, quiz time, because I can't stand to watch you all fall asleep while I talk. So. Uh, what system that you know about has this structure? Has a planner inside it. A very popular system, model predictive control. Awesome, good, good, good. Model predictive control, they're right. That's about having the planner and executing the first thing and planning again. What learning system? It actually knows the T and the R, but it estimates a pi hat and a Q hat, and then it does planning online. Let's see, I will start giving you clues. It actually plays a game. You can play different games against an opponent. A game with black and white stones. Good. Okay. Can I restate the question? The question is, what system do you have you discussed almost surely in this class? Alpha zero. Yay. Good. Okay. Good. That has this same character. That is, it does reasoning online, right? In fact, alpha zero, it, it by now, this used to not be true, but now in the current iterations, the pi and the q that they have inside the head of alpha zero are good enough that you could execute them directly, like in this strategy. But the fact is, it's even better if you, they do reasoning, if they use the pi and the q to help guide some search. And that makes the actual policy work better. So I just, I just wanna, you know, I'm, I'm kind of an old person and I'm gonna talk about kind of old fashioned way of doing things in some ways. But a bunch of these ideas are still, they're like, they're not only, they're old, but they're also still useful. So, so there, so good, alpha go, alpha zero, you guys got it. Okay, and I wanna argue that this strategy is particularly useful when um, you, the space is big enough, the space of, of states, of situations that could happen is big enough that it's, it's maybe not reasonable to imagine that offline you will have solved for a very good solution to all possible situations. My favorite example of this is, um, is, is, is traveling. I don't know, we haven't been traveling lately, but I like to think about this traveling. So if you're traveling to, you know, taking a long trip to another continent, um, lots of things can happen, right? Like planes get delayed and I don't know, I've had a, 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 a an air, a terminal be closed because of a, of a water leak. I've had people with the machine guns show up in the hallway and tell me to not go to the left. I've had all kinds of crazy things happen while I was traveling. And I don't think it's sensible to imagine that I have pre-compiled a reaction to every possible situation that could happen, right? And that in fact, I had to maybe invoke some reasoning to decide what to do in those cases. Okay. But if we're gonna talk about planning, reasoning, thinking about the effects of our actions, uh, we have to think about what space we wanna do the planning in. And 
you know, you can read now there's more and more kind of model based type papers and some people are doing trying to do planning in a kind of a raw space, sometimes in images. Um, and, but images is a hard space to learn and transition model in so then maybe we can cook up a latent space to put the transition model in and so on. But I just want to argue at least here that you have to take a lot of care with uh, a good kind of abstraction so that if you're going to do planning online. Uh, it's, 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 it's effective and efficient. And I'll talk more about that. Okay, so then I personally end up with a kind of a crazy system. And again, like there's lots of people right now in the RL world who are building systems that look sort of like this, right? Where now we say, oh, I'm gonna get my observation of the world. Maybe that's an image. And then I'm gonna run it through some box that like tries to uh, interpret it in some way. Maybe it produces a scene graph or some list of objects and relations or something like that. And here I have it being only feed forward, but actually, for any problem that I care about, it needs to have memory, right? Because I don't know about you, but I remember a lot about what's in my kitchen and I can't see it right now, but I can think about it. And so I need to kind of know, uh, I need to know about it. And then I can take this S hat, this kind of some estimate. I'm actually really interested in the case where this is a, a probability distribution over S, right? So in the case of, of a POM DP where we have partial observability, Generally speaking, we actually, instead of estimating a, a, a world state, we give out a distribution of our world states. Now the planner can take that and do something with it. And now maybe it gives out, uh, instead of a low level control action, maybe it gives out a kind of an abstract action. And then maybe I have a low level controller that can actually you know, do the torques that would make that work. Okay. But um, the horizon might still be too long. And another thing that I spend time thinking about is actually, and I probably won't go into this more today, but actually doing this planning hierarchically. So making a high level plan, like with four steps, you know, to get to the airport by getting to the, you know, get to my local airport, take a flight, get to the other airport, take a taxi. Okay, that's my high level plan. Now I have to take the first step of that and decompose it. Okay, let me just look at what my timing is like. Um, okay, good. Um, so, all right, so let's go back. We talked about a space of policies and we talked about a space of problems. So let's think about how we can do things with the space of problems and the space of policies. So down in the lower left corner, certainly one strategy that has worked well for a long time and continues to work really awesomely is just en is engineering, right? So smart people understand the problem, they use principles of engineering and control, and they build Atlas, which can do parkour. Okay, so that's good. Don't forget that. There's also, okay, suddenly, there's a funny other thing that happens down in this corner these days. Okay, so I wanna talk about, so there's this robot that can manipulate the Rubik's cube. And it's a very simple problem in the sense that it's a very narrow problem, right? This job, what this robot can do is manipulate that cube and nothing more. So it's very narrow. So it's all the way over on the left-hand side. And it's totally known to the engineers what the job is. Right? So it's all the way over on the bottom. So very narrow, totally known, but we don't know how to apply classical engineering very well to just write that controller. So what are we doing? Okay, so this is a funny thing. This is like a, it's like a pun. It's like, and I think it's a source of a lot of like confusion in the way we talk about reinforcement learning. So if you think that robot that, that did the Rubik's cube was made using reinforcement learning, but the reinforcement learning happened completely offline, completely in the factory. It didn't, the robot, when it was behaving, didn't learn anything. In fact, the learning happened completely in simulation, right? So what's this RL in the factory thing? What's the setup? The idea is that I, in the factory, right, we're still all the way over inside the factory, I make a simulation of the world that my robot is supposed to be in. And I run a uh, reinforcement learning algorithm. I connect it up to the simulator with the reward and the observations and the actions and all of that. And I run it for a while until a policy pops out uh, or a value function or something like that. And then I take that thing that popped out of the factory and that's what I run 
on my actual robot in the actual world. Okay, so I think of this as a compiler. I think of it as a compiler. It takes in as input a simulator and it gives out as output a policy. Um, and I wanna talk about how to evaluate this compiler and then I'm gonna make you actually speak to me again. Okay, so I'm gonna make some assertions. Um, actually, this one, re reward during learning doesn't matter. So there's an assertion. Um, and it doesn't really matter how many trials we have of interaction with the simulator. I want to argue that the only thing that matters in this case is this curve over here, which is where we think about computation. It's like a compile, it's an anytime compiler, right? The longer, generally speaking, the longer you compute, the better the policy that pops out. And all that matters is how good the policy is that pops out when you're done. Okay, so do you, do you want to, does that make sense? Do you, does it not make sense? Do you wanna argue with me? Hmm, okay, I like hmm, that's a, that's a human out there. Makes me happy. I mean, I was, I will say, I was, um, uh, uh, I was sitting at dinner with a very famous reinforcement learning person arguing this position about um, uh, a, a game playing system and saying, it doesn't matter if it wins or loses when it's learning. And he was like, oh no, it matters a lot. It doesn't matter at all, right? What matters is the quality of the thing that comes out. No one's gonna argue. The reward it accrues. Right, good, the reward it accrues doesn't make a darn bit of difference, right? So when we talk, you probably have talked a lot in this class or somewhat at least about exploration and exploitation. Ah, good, 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 good. Doesn't the reward help it access more important parts of the space? Right, so the thing is, there are two there's there are two things which you can kind of separate you're absolutely right that when you're doing this rl in the simulator right that's kind of like a version of dynamic programming where you're taking samples and you're getting data by like pretending to walk around in the world but look if you own the simulator first of all you don't have to you don't have to obey all the protocols that you have to obey if this were the real world like for instance, you could reset it to any state you want. You could sit in one state and try all the actions several times if you wanted to and see what each of them did. You can interact this, with this any way you want to. Like there's no rules, it doesn't matter. It's just a simulator. Similarly, you're right that you have to explore in the sense that you wanna be sure that you cover the state space in some good way. But it's not necessary that the exploration has to be, has to feel like the kind of exploration that like a mouse does when it's actually in the world and it actually has to choose its actions. Like your ideas about exploration could be really quite different. So yes, it is important that you visit the important part of the state space and where important is a difficult idea. I'm not, you know, we're, we're not sure what that is, but it is not important that the agent, that the set of simulator queries you make generates a lot of reward value. What do I mean by computation time? Is it training time? Right, I mean, I, I mean all the work that we do. So this is, right, so this is training time in the factory, but it's also really, in some ways, it's like, how long does it take the simulator to run? And it's how long does it take you to fish things out of your replay buffer? And it's all of that all added together because in some sense, inside the computer, it's all uh, fungible. It doesn't, you know, out of all the time I spend here, it doesn't matter how much of it is spent computing the simulator update and how much of it is spent doing the neural network training or whatever. It's just, you have to pay for it all. So defining the actual reward function via reward shaping is important. Right, right, that's right. So, well, 
Reward shaping might be important, but certainly some method of making sure that you explore a lot is important. That is true. Um, but you're right, crashing is totally good, but crashing does, doesn't matter. Like in the simulator, you can crash all day long. Maybe that's a good idea. Maybe that's the most efficient way in computation sense to learn a good policy. Can reward help us avoid spending time on parts of the state space that aren't crucial? Yes, so that's right. So that's why, so I think it's, it's and, and I don't know an optimal strategy for doing this. I just wanna kind of open your minds to the fact that the space of strategies for doing this, I think is bigger than the ones that we often consider. You're right that the reward is important because you don't, for instance, need to learn, you don't actually need to learn a policy over the absolutely whole space, probably, given if you know some initial distribution, then maybe there's parts of the space that no good policy will ever visit. And so there's no point in learning what to do in those parts of the space. So in that sense, yes, the reward should play a role in how you decide to do this process. But having the reward be informative or play a role doesn't isn't the same thing as saying you should behave in a way that gets you a lot of reward. Okay, I will go on. This is an interesting way of doing question and answer. Good. Um, good. Okay, so that was just a, that was a side note about evaluating offline reinforcement. I think so. Oh, so let me just rant for one minute. Nobody, nobody evaluates it this way, as far as I can tell. And there's lots of argumentation about whether it is fair or not fair to do various things in your reinforcement learning algorithm when it's an offline reinforcement learning algorithm. And I think absolutely everything is fair. It doesn't matter. You do absolutely anything you want to to go from what you know about the problem to a policy. But it should you should try to make it not take too long. And you should try to make it give you good policies. Okay. All right. So as the domain gets more complicated, I think what people have been doing then is kind of actually um, building systems that do more online deliberation, right? So these ones just they kind of <clears throat> online, they just have a policy that they execute. Alpha zero, mu zero, right? They're starting to do more kind of reasoning online. Um, I'm going to take a minute and talk a little bit about a system that I've worked on for a while uh, called hierarchical planning in the now. Um, and it doesn't do any learning at all. So it's all the way blue. So it's just very engineered, but it works. It's very broad in the set of problems that it can address. And well, the reason that I spent time over here in this corner, even though I am interested in learning and I am interested in problems where we don't know uh, uh, you know, everything about the domain that we're going to work in, um, is that I wanted to understand some structural ideas that we could maybe use to then move up in the learning direction. So I want to talk about that. Okay, now first I have a tiny little, another rant. So, you know, you, you asked me to come and talk to you, you get some ranting. All right, so we talked about this RL in the factory business, right? Where you build a simulator and you do RL and out pops a, a strategy. And I wanna just for a little while contrast it to the strategy that we old fashioned people use when we make a robot that is supposed to do a lot of problems in the world. And, the, and, and I think it's really an interesting contrast and, and worth understanding. Um, uh, and, and the way uh, my colleague Tomas would describe it is that they're both very general systems in a sense, but they're general in different senses. So this RL strategy tends, is a very general strategy for taking simulations and making policies. And one of the things that's in fact so attractive about it is that you could pretty much, you could put any simulator in there and get a policy for any kind of domain. So it's very, very general in at the methodology level. But in it seems to be really most successful when the actual system that we're producing is relatively narrow. That is to say, it's really focused on some 
pretty a task that's not very, very high variance. So we have a general methodology for producing narrow systems, we might say. The other methodology, which I'll talk about, is a way of producing systems that are themselves general at behavior time, so that I have one robot that can do a whole bunch of things. Maybe it's not as general in the, in the set of domains that it can address, but the one system can do many things instead of a methodology for making individual systems, each of which can do one thing. All right, so in both cases, we have to specify the reward, right? You have to tell the system what you want. Um, in the problems I work on, well, so let me talk about uh, specifying reward versus specifying, like say some kind of a goal. And I'm gonna uh, just make a little detour here. I don't know if you folks have talked about this, um, but, but there's the, a suite of problems that you could try to solve with a robot. Um, they are all involved manipulating objects in various ways or just moving the hand. So it's a kind of an interesting test suite. We looked at these and said, well, man, these are all pretty easy robot problems. If you just, if you know about your robot, they seem like they're maybe not so hard. Um, we, I spent personally some time trying to understand the reward function. So I'd looked at the reward function in MetaWorld for the pick and place task, and this is it. Okay, that was terrifying. I expected to find like, some numbers or a couple lines of code, but no, this is the reward function. The reward function has memory. Um, and so I, I boiled it down. So I studied that code. Uh, it has like 10 param 12 parameters, it has 12 constants in it. And uh, it's a program, almost a program, not quite a program, but almost a program. And it says things like, well, if you don't have anything in your hand, then you should try to go toward the, you get rewarded for moving, you get super local reward for moving toward the object. And then if your fingers are kind of like around the object pretty close, then you get suddenly rewarded for closing your fingers and if you've got the thing and so on. So it's like a program for solving a problem, which is like, you know, I don't, I don't object to engineering, but I want it to be exposed, right? So some poor student, I think had to do a ton of work to write this reward program and come up with the constants. In our system, I specify the goal by saying this. I want this object to be at that pose. OK, now I'm not going to tell you I don't have to do engineering too. I just have to do different engineering. OK, so reward function for the RL thing, goal for my thing. We both have to put in the URDF, which is basically, a, I mean, basically a description of the robot's kinematics and the objects in the world and how they move and so on. Uh, we put it into different places though, right? So in the RL in the factory approach, we put the URDF actually into the simulator, right? We have to build a simulator for the robot. So that needs URDF. I put the URDF into my planning system somewhere because I'm gonna plan how to move the robot. They need physics. We need something else which feels, I think, insurmountable to some people, but I want to argue that it's not too complicated. So we need the models that we're going to use for planning. And they're an abstraction of the lowest level joint kinematics. So we're going to, we're going to need some operator descriptions that describe a kind of an abstract way of interacting with the world. So that feels like the most weird and alien thing that we're going to have to do that RL people don't have to do. And so I'm going to spend some time talking about that. Okay. So I said that our class of pro our, that our individual system was very general, but our class of problems is actually somewhat, oh, substantially more specific than the class of problems an RL algorithm can solve because an RL algorithm can address stock transactions and ad placement and all those things. And I am for now going to focus on interacting with things in the world with the robot. And I'm going to say that I want to do planning, but I can't do planning like at raw simulator level. And so I want to build an abstract model of the robot's capabilities. And um, abstractions are interesting, right? You never, you always, you don't get something for nothing. So when you want to build an abstraction, you're gonna you do it because it makes your computational problem easier, but it will generally make your solutions worse. But you're willing to make that trade-off because 
generally speaking, if, you know, if I had to plan to cook dinner at the level of joint torques, I couldn't do it. <clears throat> okay. So I will now talk just a little bit about an abstraction for interacting with the physical world that uh, is, I think, very useful. And it's in some sense, the foundation for stuff we do. Um, so we assume that the robot and the objects are kinematic chains in a 3D workspace. This could be generalized, but for right now, this is what we assume and that we can represent a world state in terms of poses and properties of objects. Um, and we're gonna think about modes of the dynamics of the system. So the easiest way, I mean, there's a bunch of fancy ways you can talk about it and, but I think the easiest way to think about it is the following thing. If you think about your kitchen or my office or something, in terms of its state, there's a whole lot of state variables, right? There's the positions of my joints, but there's also like the positions of all the books and all the details of everything, what's in the water glass on my desk, all these things, those are all state variables. And a mode, let's call an interaction mode, uh, uh, a kind of a, a subspace, the, the subspace of this whole space that we can move through by moving my joints. So if I'm not touching anything, I'm in one mode and a certain set of state variables change when I change my joints and it's really only my joint variables. But if I like pick up a pencil, now when I move my joints, I'm changing some other state variables like the position of the pencil. So I'm in a different mode. So the modes are smooth physics, low dimensional, only related really to how complicated I am, but I can change modes, right? So there's a, the idea of a mode family. Let me not get into the details. Let me just do an example. I think it will be clearer. Actually, I have to show you this picture because I love this picture. Um, this is not the, th th this idea is from like, I don't know, maybe, uh, way before ICRA 2020, 15 years ago or so, maybe. It's probably even older than that. But let me let me tell you about this picture. So think of these, th th this, these pictures as the whole state space of the whole domain, right? So that's me and, and everything in my office. Let's say that's my state space, right? Positions of all the things and more than positions potentially. When I'm in free space mode, I'm, I'm moving on this green manifold, which means I can only change a very small number of dimensions of this gigantic state space. Because I'm not touching any objects, I can't change where they are. I'm just moving in my little low dimensional manifold. But if I go and intersect with the pink manifold, that's like the moment of picking up the pencil. And once I'm picking up the pencil, now I move in a different manifold. It's the pink manifold. It's the one where the pencil's in my hand. Now, if I put the pencil back down in a different place, uh, it's like I get a different, it's called a foliation. I love that. I love that this is sort of topology talk that underlies this, right? So there's, this thing is a foliation. There's, a, there's another mode, which is very similar to the free space mode that I was in before, which, but it's not exactly the same because I put the pencil down in a different place. So I changed the pencil's position and now I'm moving in a Manifold that's like kind of like parallel to the one I was in before, but it's not the same as the one. All right. Um, I don't know if this makes sense. I'm happy to answer questions about it if you want to ask. I'll tell you why we care next. Yeah, maybe the idea. So modes are, don't have to be picking and placing objects. You can, there's pushing and so on. Um, so we model the class of meta world problems as uh, essentially a lifted multimodal motion planning problem. So let me decode all of this, right? So multimodal motion planning, I just kind of talked about, right? So there's these idea of modes. One mode is moving in free space. These are mode families. Another mode family is picking an object, moving while holding it and putting it down, right? So that lets me, picking lets me enter a different leaf Moving while holding moves through a different leaf and placing lets me move back out into the free space. I can push things and I can operate them. That's like grabbing a handle and turning it. 
it's lifted because what lifted means is abstracted over objects. So I can describe in my planner mode families even generically so that I don't have to talk about picking up this particular pencil or the eraser. I can talk about picking up objects just kind of in the abstract and talk about moving while holding them. And it depends on their shape and it could depend on their mass and some other things, but it doesn't depend on the fact that this is eraser 973. Question, this is like hyperdynamics. Yes, this is hyperdynamics. Yes, exactly. It's like, but it's hyperdynamics in a very high dimensional state space where we get to pick uh, which, which modes of the hyperdynamics we want to move through, right? So planning then becomes at the, at the high level of abstraction of planning, it's like you pick a mode family sequence. Like first I'm gonna pick up this object and then I'm gonna pick up a tray and then I'll put this object on the tray and then I'm gonna take the tray somewhere. That would be like picking a mode family sequence. And then I could pick a bunch of parameters. Okay. And so we, uh, we just used our planner to solve a bunch of the meta world problems, no learning involved. Um, our basic set of modes, pick, place, and push, and, and turn, and basically turn and slide things, uh, solved 43 out of the 50. Um, one of them needs a different mode, which we don't have, which we could put in, but we haven't done. So I, you know, you, you could trust me on that or not, which was like, there's one where the only way to solve it is to press your hand up against something and use frictional contact to slide the thing up. So I would have to write a new piece of code, not very much, but I would have to write a new little thing and add a new mode family in order to solve that. Some of the other ones we can't solve because Mujoko physics is not like actual physics. Um, so I don't feel bad about that. <sighs> okay, where are we? Good. Um, so, right, so I'm gonna take this architecture now and talk just a little bit about the hardcore, th the kind of completely engineered thing we built. The one thing, one added thing it has in it is this hierarchical planning idea that I talked about before. I think I'm not gonna go into it in detail. All right, I'm gonna show you a video of our robot doing this stuff. Um, and before I show the video, I have to say that give this disclaimer, which is, any given thing that you see this robot doing, you, any one of you could program the robot to do, uh, I don't know, you know, in a week or two, and it would be better than what we have here, but the same code did all these things. Okay, not exactly, exactly the same code because we fixed it up over time a little bit, but basically it's a very general purpose thing. So here we told it to put the blue object where the soup can is and it saw the soup can was in the way and moved it out. So there's no, this is all doing planning completely at the, well, planning and belief space, which I haven't talked about, but basically it's doing something like that multimodal motion planning. It's thinking about what high level actions it has to take and then finding uh, parameters. And sometimes it has to actually make quite a complicated uh, reasoning about setting up the preconditions to do another action and so on. Um, let's see. So uh, it, it's doing all that. And it's also keeping an explicit representation of what it does and doesn't know about the world that it's in. Um, which we can see the results of that in a little bit. So here we asked it to move the green object to the corner of the table. The green object is too big to pick up. So it has to push it. It figures that out. It, uh, we didn't tell it to push anything. It just figured out that it had to push the green object. And to push the green object, it figures out it has to get the orange one out of the way. So it picks up the orange one. Doesn't bother putting it down because why bother? Pushes the green one. It knows that the pushing is not reliable. So it always looks to see Again, it plans to look to reduce its uncertainty, sees that it didn't work very well, re-executes and so on. Here we told it to go out of the room. It knows that it has to be sure that there's free space. And when it looked, it saw that there wasn't free space. So it dragged the one chair out of the way, which we sort of expected it to do. And here again, it just brought that chair with it. Here we asked it to put a full oil bottle on the other table. It picked up one and felt the force. So that was reasoning to gather information and so on. Okay, um, but so 
the one thing to know about this whole thing is that there is zero machine learning involved in any aspect whatsoever. Oh, oh yeah, and we ran it on this crazy for buttons and board. Let me just stop that. Okay. Um, there was no learning except for me and Tomas. Also, this is Python code written by old professors. Just um, so you know, it was a little slow and a little whatever. But it was like it's not so bad, you know. It's like it looks sort of smart. Okay. So now the question is. How can we, you know, can we take what, what we did and move up? How do we move up? How do we think about systems? Because so far all the examples we've talked about are cases where basically the engineers knew about the domain and they needed to make a policy. And they either did it by running reinforcement learning in the factory or by hand building something. So now I wanna talk about the other extreme for a minute, which is RL in the wild, which I would argue is the case that reinforcement learning was, was invented for, right? Um, it was invented as a model of how animals learn online from their experience in the world, where they don't know very much about what's going on. Uh, somebody drew this cartoon for me, I love it, right? So if you, certainly RL in the wild is not what you want if you want the robot to come to your house and make kitchen, right? It shouldn't be learning about physics while it's there. <laughs> And the reason is that now I think the objective function for RL in the wild, if you're running reinforcement learning in a robot that's in your house, then it's the, the kind of curve that you should make is completely different. The, the way you should evaluate it is completely different. And what matters is how many dishes you break, starting from the very beginning. Like you don't get any free broken dishes. Uh, you just want to measure the cumulative reward over time. So what's interesting is that almost nobody measures this either. So almost nobody measures either the thing that I think you should measure if you're doing offline RL, and almost nobody measures this, which is what I think you should measure if you're doing online RL. We measure this something that's sort of par way in between. Um, does this point make sense? Any questions about that? Okay, so we have like 20 more minutes or so, 25 minutes, is that, yeah? Okay, this is good, we're good. Okay, so that was RL in the wild. And you know, there's a bunch of stuff that you may have talked about or maybe you'll visit in this class of like trying to do reinforcement learning where you, where you know something about the problem, right? So maybe you're doing meta RL, which is where like in the factory, you do some learning on some tasks and that you hope to be set up so that in the wild, you can learn efficiently. Or Bayesian RL is another, another thing. So now I want to come over here and talk about kind of the way I'm thinking about taking the stuff that we've done and moving it up the axis. OK, so I had this kind of architectural picture, which has a bunch of pieces. And now we can think about, well, how can we learn different pieces and parts of this thing? So the first thing I wanna talk about is work that we're like really just doing right now. And in fact, we don't even really have a paper, although I hope to have it soon to circulate. Um, and the idea is the following. Um, in, the, in the manipulation stuff I showed you so far, we had to have we had to have models of the object classes. We had to know in advance, not just the classes, no, no, excuse me. We had to have models of the instances. We had to know the shape of the oil bottles we were gonna be operating on or the shape of the blocks or the cans or whatever we had to know in advance exactly what the universe of objects was. So one step that we can make uh, of, to generalize things, which I like to call mom, manipulation with zero models, um, is to keep absolutely everything about the old pipeline, so the basic kind of task and motion planner and so on, but to say that we are not going to know in advance the shapes of the objects, like nothing, not the classes, not anything. So first of all, all the vision people who tell you the vision is done, they're wrong. So we tried everybody's favorite segmentation algorithm and they all kind of suck. Um, but that's okay. Especially, and they tend, the ones that don't, the ones that kind of work are usually trained for some specific objects or specific classes. And we really wanted to be 
class independent because I could put a bunch of crazy objects on the table and you could manipulate them just fine without having any idea what they are. So the question is, how can we do that? So one idea uh, would be to say, oh, well, what you have to do is you have to like look at the scene and totally build a perfect mesh model of all the objects and then just call my planner. That would be one strategy. That didn't work out very well, not surprisingly. I mean, we knew that wasn't gonna work. So what we did instead is we got like everybody's best pre-trained thing for um, doing segmentation, for doing shape completion, for predicting good reliable grasps on, on meshes and so on. And we made sure that the language that we used in our planner to describe the preconditions of the actions, basically to describe what has to be true to change modes, was all described in terms of these properties that we had pre-trained detectors for. And then we did our kind of usual business. So we used, I don't know, we used these things. Seems like whatever, current modern stuff. And if you made a better one, we would, could just use it. Um, so let me just show you uh, some things that the robot can do. Let me just stop for a second. Okay. Um, so again, I want to argue that, so we get super duper generalization for free. Uh, we, we have this perception, which is now segmenting the scene and telling us about these objects and predicting some things about doing shape completion, predicting where we can pick them up and so on. But we are goal conditioned. Oh, I don't know. It doesn't even make sense to call it that. We can put in a goal in, in logic and the robot can do it pretty well. Oops. Oh no. Okay. Let me go again. Um, so, okay. So here's the robot doing some things. It can do more things now. This was a, a video for Iris. Right? It's not always perfect. That's okay. We, we have a loop. Like, so for planners don't have to have perfect worlds. So here we told it to put all the objects in the bowl of the same color, approximately. Here we told it to put the objects on a mat of an opposite color. Um, uh, so, you know, and it decided it needed to move the drill a little bit to get the bowl on there. This one I like because um, the, the cup was originally hidden. So when it saw the scene, it said, oh, I just have to move the, the cheese -a box over to the green region. When it picked up the cheese -a box, it said, oh no, there's another object over there. So now it has to deal with that. Um, so it puts it over there, misses the box, decides to move the cup for some reason. Yeah, so it's not perfect, but it's like, it's non-terrible. And it can do fancier things in simulation because that's how simulation is. Um, so that's an example of taking my architecture here and learning kind of perceptual modules to make it better. We can also learn other kinds of things. So another kind of thing is we can learn an operator model. So I'll talk about this and then probably that will be enough. We'll see. Um, so, okay, so almost all the current work in reinforcement learning on robots is about learning new skills, right? So you could learn cutting and pushing and stirring and pouring and throwing and all these things. And that's good. Like, I think there are good methods for doing that. Um, but you know, nobody wants a robot that can only cut. So the question is, after you've learned how to cut things or push them or stir them, how do you put that together into a bigger system that can do all those things and do it for some reason, right? So what we focused on was this question of how could we build like one of those sort of multimodal motion planning type models of a skill so that we could add it to the robot's general repertoire. So an example here is pouring. So imagine that you learned a nice controller, some kind of feedback controller or something for pouring. Um, we could characterize the situation of pouring in terms of the sizes of the cups that we're pouring from and into and so on, in terms of their relative offsets between the two things, in terms of maybe some gain parameter to your controller. And the way we would describe that is using uh, something that looks sort of like this, right? That this is something like the, what the high level planner would use. It would say, well, if you wanna get some liquid in some destination, 
uh, you can you can call the pouring skill with some game parameter. And in order to think about whether that's going to work or not, we have to depend on some properties of the situation in which we call the control. So it better be that the source container has some liquid in it and we're holding the source container with some grasp and these things have some shape and there's some relative pose. And what I really need to know is a constraint, a kind of a relation on all these continuous parameters uh, that has the property that if this relation holds, if this constraint is true of all these parameters and I call my pouring program policy, whatever it is with this gain parameter, then afterwards there will be liquid in the destination. So this is like learning a model. It's like learning an abstract transition model, you could say, of, of, of the action. Now, in this case, a human wrote everything but the constraint. I have some other work that's about actually relaxing that. But for right now, let's just imagine that we're not learning the structure of this rule. We're just learning the, the, like the, the tricky technical bit of the rule. And we do this using Gaussian process regression. So the idea is you can think of this as a regression problem, right? You can take an assignment of values to all these parameters, call it theta, and get out some kind of score, which says, how well did it work? And so we can imagine simulating, in this case, we did it in simulation and also in the real robot, but we can do experiments uh, with a bunch of different situations, right? So this is different values of these parameters and we can see how well they work. And um, for technical reasons, we use uh, Gaussian process regression. Um, the idea is that, so theta, right, theta is the parameters, the description of the situation in which you were pouring, and this G is the scoring function. And it's important to us to know, right, so a Gaussian process, not sure if you guys know about that, but it's, you can think of it as a distribution over possible functions. So what I'm showing you here in red is like the mean value. It's our best estimate of the function of the score that we would get if we executed the pouring program in situation theta. And so the, the red line is the, is the mean estimate of this function and the pink area is like our confidence bounds. So in some parts of the space, we're more confident than others. And what's interesting for instance about this region here with the little black line is that this is a case where we're confident that the score will be above zero. So if you, if you pick zero to just be like good enough to, to be willing to do the pouring action, then what this says is that if you can arrange for yourself to be in this part of the parameter space and you execute the pouring uh, procedure, then it's gonna work out. So we're interested in this uncertainty quantified estimate of the function so that for instance, we can try to do pouring in a way that's reliable but we're interested also in estimating this whole function or a lot of the function if we can for the following reason. You might say, look, just learn one way of pouring. If you just learn one good strategy, one way of, of putting you know, one vessel relative to the other one, if you just learn one that works, that's all you need because why do you need to figure it all out? But the answer is you might need a different way of pouring because um, maybe you're working in a restaurant and you can't get around to the back corner and you have to pour in this like funny backhanded wine waiter way of pouring or you need to do it with your elbow up or maybe you broke your arm and you have to do it with your other hand. Like it's uh, understanding something about the space of feasible ways of doing this gives you more flexibility to take into account constraints that might be in, placed on you due to the situation in the world in which you're trying to actually execute the skill. So, okay, so there's a bunch of technical stuff. We also use this idea of uncertainty so that we can try to uh, gather information about this function efficiently with few experiments. Um, I'm gonna skip this and this and just play you this movie, right? So, you know, we did this like in real life um, and this is just meant to illustrate the fact that um, you do want to minimize the number of experiments you do because we had to pick up a whole lot of beans off the floor 
And also, just as a funny note, ha, funny, these are chickpeas, dried chickpeas, which uh, got left out in bowls in the lab when we all disappeared for pandemic. And then after like several months, somebody went back and the lab was just covered in mouse poo. So that's what happens to the chickpeas if you're not looking. Okay, so, but what can we do? So having learned stuff from doing that, we can take the skills and incorporate them into our planner and now ask the robot to do stuff. So we can put these objects on the table. We can tell the robot, you know, put some stuff in the white white cup and it and it does. Um, but it's it's more general than that, right? So, well, okay, so in this case, we said it should serve some stuff. Here it's moving the green thing out of the way so that it can get to the blue cup. We didn't tell it to do that. It just inferred that it had to. Um, uh, it's going to do another example, and then it'll do one that I like that I just kind of want to talk about in a minute. Oh, here we told it to, again, serve the stuff by putting it on top of the purple thing, whatever. Um, in this next example, um, the bowl is so far over that it wouldn't be able to pour with that other hand. So it, again, reasoned that it should push the bowl over into the space in front of it where it could reach it and then pour. Okay, so yay. Um, I'm going to skip this uh, and say one thing about search control and then answer questions and we'll be out of here. So another thing that's really important, right, another lesson that we learned from Alpha Zero, for instance, is that um, search control is really important. That in, if you want to do some kind of online planning and reasoning, uh, it's bad. You, you know, exponential search is not good for anybody. And in our cases, the searches are infinite, right? So. If you think of one way of thinking about doing that kind of task and motion planning is that you might pick a discrete action like which object to operate on and then some continuous parameters about how to grasp it or where to put it down. Um, and so this is like a big, big search space. So we have a discrete layer, we have a continuous layer. And an important thing to note is that every single node expansion in the search is really expensive because it generally involves calling a motion planner. Right, to see if it's feasible to even do this in this situation. So this is a, a difficult search problem. So we did some stuff where we wanted to try to learn search control, but we wanted to generalize. And so a question was, so here's this robot and it can pick up these objects and, and try to move them out of the way. So this is a, a problem that some people call NAMO, navigation among movable objects. Uh, and it's trying to get the red object into the other room in the apartment, or in some cases, it's trying to get all the objects into the other room in the apartment. And we have this other problem where there's these objects in these shelves. And a question we might ask is, well, can we learn some stuff from the apartment moving the big boxes that would still apply to moving the little things on the shelf? And so the idea here was to try to learn a cube function um, at the abstract level. So uh, we had an intuition that um, it might be enough or not enough, but it might be easier in some ways to learn uh, still a Q function using the basic idea of Q functions that you already understand, but where we think of it only really about the discrete actions under the assumption that the planner is gonna do the best job it can of picking the continuous parameter. So you pick a discrete action like pick object A you assume that some other sampling method, which we could talk about, but I'm not going to, uh, is going to pick the best continuous parameters. And we're interested in knowing what's the Q value doing that. So this way we can kind of reduce the branching factor and so on. We use a graph neural network to represent this Q function, right? Because in different problem instances, there will be different numbers of objects. So that's important. And we hand design some features to compute and put on the nodes and arcs. And, and they're actually really important. So they involve uh, actually to compute the features in the graph neural network, we have to do some motion planning calls. And there are things like, is this object in the way of that? Right, so is the red object in the way of the green object? So uh, Bob Dune thought that was an important feature. I think he was right. So we make the graph neural network, we learn the parameters in the graph neural network so that we can regress from a scene described this way to a Q value. 
And then we do this training, oh, loss function doesn't matter. Um, and so we did some stuff where we trained only on moving a single large object. Uh, and, um, and we're interested in knowing how does it perform when we have to move all the big objects or when we have to just move the little objects in the cupboards. Um, and there's an existing algorithm in the literature that's pretty good. So that's the blue thing. We cooked up a simple heuristic, which terrified us for a little while because it worked really well in two of the domains, but it totally didn't work even a little bit in the third domain. And um, the learn thing works kind of nicely in all the cases. So this isn't like an, an enormous win or anything, but it does show that we can learn something from experience that does improve our search abilities. Um, so, you know, what my hope is that eventually that we can kind of do a bootstrapping thing where you pick a property in the world, you see if you can plan to make it true. If you have a plan, you execute it. Uh, if you can't find a plan, maybe you have to do a little reinforcement learning to learn a local skill. You try to throw that into your planning soup. Uh, when you execute a plan and things go wrong, you update your models. Maybe you define new concepts, invent new properties, learn to predict those properties and so on. So I'm gonna finish, uh, yeah, um, just for fun. This is, there's a talk I gave uh, in a big audience a long time ago, and this was my, my closing slide. At the time, what, 90, I can't see now when it was it, 97 or something? Yeah, 97, okay. I said, well, there's been a lot of progress in algorithms for learning. Um, and now like really, there's really been a lot of progress, uh, like a vast amount of progress in algorithms for, for learning. Um, I wanted to say then that it didn't give us solutions for building autonomous agents. Now you might say, well, it gives us some solutions for building autonomous agents, but I don't think it takes us as far as it needs to go. And that we need human insight still, I think, to be able to complement the machine learning stuff. And the kind of human insight that I want to build in is not facts, but ideas about algorithmic decomposition, right? Ideas about having some searching online and what search algorithm might you use and how might you learn some pieces of structure that can help that? Um, so uh, this is good. And it was work with a bunch of students. And here's the robot screwing up. And we have a few minutes. So I'm happy to answer any questions. No questions. The TAs must at least have. Well, I have one question. Uh, uh -huh. Hi, thank you for the for the talk. It was very interesting. So, if you could go back to the factory AI factory slide when you have the two axes. Um, yeah. Like this one. Uh, yeah. Well, in there was the most the the latest one that you showed is the, the one that. I'm thinking about the one that you showed um, meta reinforcement learning there. Oh, so that yeah. kind of made me think about two things. So the first is, um, couldn't like why, what ha, why have you placed meta reinforcement learning in the leftmost part? Um, since I I understand that some studies uh, want to use meta reinforcement learning more to kind of be able to generalize more in in more diverse environments. And then the, the other question maybe, do you think that um, you can trade both axes? So instead of, of representing on, on, our, on the horizontal or vertical, you could, you could have kind of um, a curve or that trades both objectives. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So I put, so if you take meta world as an example, Right. If you say, oh, so that meta world task suite um, would go for me right here for the following reason, right? Any individual problem, any individual task is super narrow, right? Turn this faucet or pick up this object. But uh, the generality lies in the factory, right? The generality lies in the fact that it can very quickly learn to do a new thing. But the thing it can learn to do is not very complicated. So each individual policy still can't do something very complicated. Now, people are working on goal conditioned. I should now put on the slide goal conditioned RL. 
um, if you did goal conditioned, so goal conditioning moves you to the right, mm -hmm. right? So goal conditioned RLN simulation would also move you over in some way, you know, in the in the in the right word direction, and goal conditioned meta RL would move you up the diagonal. Right, goal conditioning makes you solve more general problems, and the meta part is the idea that well, you're tuned up to now learn online. Uh, so, I would say here. You're good. Thanks. No one has any controversial questions for Leslie. Really, I like it. Like, argue with me. Tell me I'm wrong. Yeah, I have a question about yeah. the like the planning. So to do planning, we have to define the state of the environment first, and that's kind of a, a like a advice that we give to the system. And uh, but sometimes I think like it's very hard to define what the state is, like the state definition. For example, if we are manipulating an object, if we know the state, then we can do the planning. But how can we define a state of the object? For example, the position is easy to define, but the orientation is kind of like depends on the coordinate system that we give on the objects. So I guess my question is like, uh, so uh, like I agree we should do perception first, but what kind of output we should we need from the perception module? Good. So I think th that's. A that's a good question. And I think, I think it's really important for the perception people and the planning people to work together because I think what's happened at the moment is that the planning people are assuming something that perception can't deliver and the perception people don't know what it is that the planning people would find useful. So we have a little bit of a gap. Um, so when I write the planner for this, this thing, um, I think about the conditions I'm going to have to test inside the planner, right? So one condition I have to test is like, what is a bounding box of this object roughly so that I can move it safely without crashing? So that's a useful thing to try to predict. It's useful to try to predict whether these two objects are one object or two, right? So segmentation. It's useful to try to predict where could I put my fingers on this thing and have it be stable or to predict what could it rest on a face. But I think the important idea is that we're not, we're trying to make predictions about aspects of the objects that are important to us, aspects of the state that matter for the problems we're trying to solve. We are not trying to compute a perfect representation of the world that we can use for anything. Mm -hmm. So that makes the perception problem, I think, feel easier. Yeah, but uh, that might change if we are uh, moving uh, beyond, for example, rigid body or like uh, like the object is uh, have some holes in this. Right. So so that's good. So what do you do about ca cables? You know, like okay. Yeah, it's very hard and, to define and, the state. And I think so. I think there's two things. One is that manipulating cables is more like pouring than it's like. Uh, the high level task and motion planning, right? So if I need to be very good at manipulating a cable, I think that that probably goes in a policy. Like that's, it's narrow, it's localized, it's, you know, maybe I don't have to reason too much about it. I can just learn to manipulate cables. But then I can still represent the state. For instance, I can say, there is a cable and it's white and it's about this big around and it takes up this volume on my desk. And maybe that at the abstract level, that's enough. And at the specific level, I'll have a policy for like unwinding it or plugging it in or doing whatever I have to do. I see. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Sure. Okay. I think time is pretty much up. If there are no more questions, let's thank Leslie once more for the wonderful talk. So okay, thank good you, Leslie. Thank you with you all. Yeah, and it's always a pleasure to listen from you, Leslie.